Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you're already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today, we're here to talk about some books that I think are underrated. So a couple of weeks ago, I put out a video talking about books that I feel are overrated, meaning they're getting a lot more hype than I feel like they deserve. Now, I actually do have a part two of that video coming out probably at some point this year. I'm still collecting some additional books to feature in that. But when I posted that video about overrated books, one of y'all actually commented and asked me to do a version of underrated books. So I have a collection here of about 10 books that I really, really enjoyed and I just don't think are talked about very often and I think deserve a little bit more love. Now, some of these are not going to come as any surprise to you if you've been on my channel for the last year or so because some of these I have talked about non-stop or at least a couple of times and others might be a little bit more of a surprise. Maybe I haven't talked about them as often or what have you but I did want to go ahead and give these books a little bit more love just because I don't feel like enough people are talking about them. These are honestly in no particular order. I just have them stacked here beside me so I'm going to grab and go and the very first one that I'm going to talk about is one that I know I've mentioned quite frequently because it's actually one that made my top books of 2023 list and that is The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brammer. This was a book of the month selection that really came out of left field and knocked me off my feet because I was not expecting to really love this one as much as I did. This follows our main character Clover and she is a death doula. She had always been fascinated by death. She traveled the world studying death and other cultures and while she was traveling her grandfather actually ended up dying alone in his office on a university campus and she kind of decided that she never wanted anybody to die alone ever again and so she kind of goes and ushers people into death who might not have anybody else to be there and she is a witness to their last words, their last regrets their last pieces of advice and she actually documents all of this stuff. She has journals of all of these little snippets that she gets from people in their final moments of life and she considers it a great honor to be there and witness this for these people. But this dedication to her job has kind of prevented her from going anywhere or moving on in her life. She still lives in the same apartment that she grew up in with her grandpa. Her only friend is like an octogenarian that lives in their building. She has never been kissed. She's never been in a relationship. So she's very kind of like stunted in her growth as an adult and she's in her mid-30s I believe at the point that this book starts. And so this book is really really all about her growth as a character as she's starting to meet new people as she's starting to build relationships and of course as she might be falling in love with somebody as well and I just thought that this was beautiful obviously this has wonderful portrayals of grief and what people go through in their final moments and what it's like for you as a survivor of somebody who has passed away and how that can deeply affect you of course this is also about moving on and getting on with your life and I just thought everything about this was stunning I absolutely loved following Clover and her journey this is certainly a very character driven story so if you're not a big fan of character driven driven stories you might not enjoy this one as much as I did but I just found this completely wonderful overall. I loved the message, I loved the story and I just liked Clover kind of finding her happy ending after everything that she went through and after all of the years that she spent by the sides of dying people. Everybody I hear who has read this book has really really enjoyed it but yet I still don't see a lot of people talking about this book and so I'm gonna mention it at every opportunity just because I thought it was wonderful. Next I have a few thrillers here that I kind of wanted to give some spotlight to just because I also don't think that they're talked about very often. This first one is actually currently on book of the month as a fan favorite so obviously it has some popularity but yet I never see anybody talk about this book and that is The Collective by Alison Galen. This was my first experience with Alison Galen and as soon as I finished it I knew it would not be my last because I enjoyed this one immensely. I think I flew through it in 24 hours. I could not put it down. This is the book that you want to read if you're interested in a good revenge story because this follows our main character and several years prior to the start of the story she lost her daughter and if I remember correctly the police were saying it was an accident. I can't remember the terms of the accident, but they basically said that no one was at fault for the death of her daughter. But she is convinced that this privileged young boy was the cause of her daughter's death. And obviously she is not over it. She has not moved on. She's still very much deep in her grief. She's actually very much attached to a guy who was the recipient of her daughter's heart. So she will go and kind of just like listen to the heartbeat just so she can feel near her daughter again. So obviously she is struggling. She's not doing well. And one day she's attending kind of like the ceremony, this banquet honoring the boy that she thinks killed her daughter and in the middle of it she loses her cool and she goes viral on the internet. That brings her to the attention of the collective. The collective is a group of women very much like her who have lost children and have received no justice and so they essentially take justice into their own hands and they complete very elaborate well-crafted schemes to get vengeance on the people that took their children and so she becomes a member of the collective and it goes from there. One of the things that I really enjoyed about this story was how extremely well-crafted it was. The collective goes through very intricate and detail-oriented plots 
to get revenge for their children. And I just thought it was so insanely clever. And I will say that the ending of this book really took me by surprise. I was not expecting it to end like it did. And I just appreciated that because it's very rare that a thriller can really surprise me or catch me off guard. And this one was absolutely able to do that. So if you are in the mood for a very quick, fast paced thriller that's going to keep the pages turning, that's going to keep you engaged and interested, I cannot recommend this enough. And I have since read one other Alison Galen that I really enjoyed as well. I just don't remember it as clearly because it was very, very complicated, but I absolutely plan on reading more from Alison Galen in the future. I think she's able to write very well crafted and clever stories. And I think that she as an author, if not just this book, deserve more attention. Pretty Little Wife by Darby Kane is a thriller that I also don't feel like gets very much attention at all. And I absolutely loved this. The tagline of this book got me. It says, shouldn't a dead husband stay dead? So this follows our main character, Lila, and her husband has gone missing and he's very beloved in the town. He's a really beloved high school teacher. So nobody knows where he is and what's going on. And Lila herself is pretty confused, not because he's missing, because she was the last person to see her husband's body and now it's gone. That was really the tagline that got me into this story and it pulled me in and it didn't let me go. I absolutely loved Lila as a character because she was steadfast. She didn't blink, she didn't flinch. You know from the outset that she is responsible for her husband's death, but really the mystery in this is where did her husband's body go after she killed him because she left him in this specific spot and he was found, but whoever found him basically took him away. And so of course there's a lot of suspicion on her as the wife, but like I said, she is unflappable. She doesn't flinch, she doesn't give anything away. This is another book that really explores the concept of what is right is not necessarily what is legal, but you know, I'm one of those messed up people that doesn't really mind good vigilante justice every now and then because we all know how flawed the American justice system could be and sometimes you know what some people they just deserve a good murder so let's just put it out there. So I really enjoyed overall what the story was able to accomplish and I liked this one. I really feel like this one should get more attention. Of course I also could not do this video without once again talking about the Dr. Alex Carter series starting with A Solitude of Wolverines by Alice Henderson. I won't spend too much time on this because I feel like I talk about this series in every single video and I actually just read the third book in this series but this essentially follows Dr. Alex Carter. She is a wild wildlife biologist and her goal is conservation and to help endangered species. She's typically on a very isolated setting and she's doing conservation work. She's studying the animals. She's following them. She's trying to learn about them so she can help their plight. And in every single book there is something sinister that's going down. One of the things that I love about this series so much is the educational aspect of this because you're learning a lot about the species that is covered in the story. You're also learning about like the anthropogenic causes that are making endangered species go extinct essentially and climate change and all that stuff. But I feel like she does it in a way that's not in your face. There's definitely a lot of information in here and it can feel like a slow buildup. But then once you're getting to the second half of the story, it is so fast paced. It is so intense. And I feel like you come out of it with more of an appreciation for what Alex Carter is doing in these stories. And I absolutely love it. This is another one that I just don't see talk about very often. And I can't wait for the fourth book to come out. So I had to mention it here. I also want to quickly talk about Stay Awake by Megan Golden. So Megan Golden herself is definitely not an underrepresented author. I think she's very, very popular, especially after the release of The Night Swim and then Dark corners. But I feel like every single other one of her books gets more attention than this one. And this to this day is still my favorite book that I've read by her because it's such an interesting concept. This starts with our main character Liv. She wakes up in the back of a cab. She has no idea where she is or how she got to the back of this cab. And she's heading to what she believes is her apartment. But she gets to this apartment and there are other people living there, not her roommate and not her. She goes to grab for her phone in her pocket and all she finds is this knife. She has no idea how it got there. And what she sees on her hand is the words stay awake. And then you're also following the perspective of a detective and there has been a grisly murder and Liv Reese is somehow connected to this murder. And so you're following Liv Reese in the present and she's trying to figure out what is happening to her because there's a huge chunk of time missing. If I remember correctly, it's about two years and two months that is missing from her time. So she's now in this very serious situation because she does not know what is going on. Her life has completely changed in those two years and she's missing all of that time. So you're following her in the present and she's trying to figure out what's happening, but you yourself are getting the puzzle pieces and you're starting to figure things out through the eyes of the detective as the detective is investigating the murder and Liv Reese. I just thought that this was very interestingly written and I really enjoyed the concept. You know, this plays around with fugue state and what can happen when you experience an event that is so incredibly traumatic that it essentially causes you to lose time, lose yourself, lose all memory of what's happened to you in recent memory. I loved it. I really, really enjoyed this. Like I said, I think that still to this day, this is my favorite Megan Golden and this is the one that I feel like does not get enough attention. Next, I have a contemporary that is another one that really came out of left field and blew me away. I had no idea going into this that it was going to be be an easy five stars. And I still to this day, since I've read this book, I don't think I've seen one other booktuber talk about it. That is one to watch by Kate Stamen London. So this follows our main character, Bia Schumacher, and she is actually a plus size fashion blogger. And she's pretty popular. You know, she has a good size audience. And she's a big fan of this reality television show that is very much like The Bachelor. But she goes onto her social media
Olivia one day and completely blasts the show for their lack of diversity and representation in body type, ethnicity, race, all of that. And so she's actually contacted by the show to see if she would be interested in being their next bachelorette. And she agrees, but she has really no idea what she is in for because there's a lot that goes into this. She is now fully in the public eye and that means she's in public scrutiny. So she's having to deal with a lot of comments and hate about her body. She's also having to deal with the people who are on the show with her, like her potential lovers, taking a look at her and not even wanting to be there anymore. So you're watching her as she's having to deal with all this. There's a lot of shame. There's humiliation. There's also anger at the show because they're putting her in these situations that they know are going to cause her to be humiliated or upset. You know, the whole point of this was for her to go on and be part of the representation. But she was also thinking that some of the guys that came on were also going to be part of the representation. You know, she was hoping to see people that had body types more like hers and things like that. And so obviously there's a very difficult time going on here, not to mention all of the body shaming that is going on on social media. I thought this was a very poignant, well-told story of our unrealistic standards of how people feel like they have the right to comment on another person's body. And she's having to confront all of this within the story. And I just thought it was really well told. I could definitely relate to a lot of things that happened in this story as a plus size person. And I felt very deeply for Bia. Of course, I also loved watching the dynamic between Bia and some of her suitors on the show, some that were more sincere than others and her developing relationships with them. And then of course, ultimately the one that she ends up with. So overall, I just think everything about this was pretty lovely. This was a very, very solid contemporary for me. And I'm looking forward to more from Kate Stamen London just because this one surprised me so deeply. Now this next one is one I know I've talked about on my channel, but it's again, one that I never see anybody talk about and it still sticks with me. I loved this book so much and I really would like more people to read it, especially people who do love a good historical fiction with a mystery. And that is Big Lies in a Small Town by Diane Chamberlain. So the present perspective in this is 2018 and it's following our main character, Morgan Christopher, who is currently in prison for a crime that she really didn't commit. But one day she's unexpectedly approached by a mysterious visitor. And I'm trying to remember, I think this mysterious visitor is a lawyer or some type of representative of an artist who has passed away, a very well-known artist. And that artist has specifically requested Morgan Christopher to restore a mural that is going up in this museum, this gallery that's going to depict the artist's work. Morgan is very, very surprised by this because while she was in art school at a time before going to prison, it was not art restoration. She knows absolutely nothing about art restoration. She has no idea how this artist even knew who she was and she's just baffled, but she's desperate to get out of prison and so she accepts. So you're following her as she's going to this small Southern town where the mural is going to hang and you're following her progress as she's restoring the mural. And as she's restoring the mural, she's finding some really upsetting things in the mural that probably would not normally be there. And so that really causes her to dive deeply into the original artist named Anna Dale, who mysteriously went missing in the 40s before the mural could be finished and hung in a post office, which is where it was originally supposed to go. So you're following Morgan in the present as she's restoring the mural and trying to find out about Anna Dale. You're also getting Anna Dale's perspective. She's been selected to restore a mural in this post office in a small North Carolina town. She's never even been to this town before, but she submitted her entry and she's going there. A lot of people in the town are not happy about it because she's not from the town. But there's also controversy surrounding her because she is helping a young black boy who wants to be an artist. She kind of has taken him under her wing and he is helping her with the mural. And there are a lot of people in town that are really, really upset about that because it's small town, North Carolina in the 1930s and the 1940s. So you're following what she's actually going through during that time and what ultimately happened when she disappeared. And like I said, you're following Morgan Christopher in the present. And then eventually those two timelines converge. This is another one that I just thought was beautifully done. I was really fascinated by the mystery in the present. Like I wanted to know what happened to Anna Dale, but I was equally as fascinated by what was going on with Anna Dale and some of the serious things that she had to endure while she was painting the mural in the town. I was captivated. I was compelled. I was engaged the whole entire time. I absolutely love her stories and this is definitely my favorite. The last historical fiction that I want to mention is one that I've talked about nonstop on my channel. So I'm not really going to say much about it, but I had to mention it here. My Dear Hamilton by Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy. This follows Eliza Hamilton from the time when she was young to when she meets Alexander Hamilton and all of the stuff that she goes into. Like I said, I don't really want to say more about this because I've talked about it ad nauseum on my channel. This was one of the best books that I read in 2023 and I've actually just read America's First Daughter by this duo and absolutely loved it as well. One of the main reasons why I love these authors so much is because they are able to bring these women to life. They are able to make you get to know them and love them and feel their loss at the end of the story, if that makes sense. And they certainly did that with Eliza Hamilton. She sacrificed so much for America and for the man that she loved, even when he was not treating her the way that she deserved to be treated. I feel like she's a lost American hero. You know what I mean? She is one of those women that really helped get our country up and running, but nobody really ever talks about her. And that's why I really appreciated what Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy were able to do with this story. Now, I understand that their books are not going to be for everybody because they're very slow. They're very long. If I remember correctly, this was almost 
almost 700 pages. Well, not quite. It's about 640 pages, but still that's a very, very long historical fiction. And if you're not into character driven stories with no plot, this is just Eliza Hamilton's life. If you don't like those kinds of stories, even if you are a historical fiction fan, you're not going to enjoy this. But I'm a very character driven reader. I was especially invested and interested in Eliza Hamilton. And so this worked for me. And I feel like it can work for a lot of people as well, especially if you listen to it. I feel like listening to these stories is the way to go. But because I don't hear enough people talk about this, I wanted to mention it here. I thought that they did Eliza Hamilton justice. I feel very honored and privileged to have read this story. Now this next one that I want to talk about, I wouldn't necessarily say it's underrated because it did make book of the month, book of the year back in 2016. I'm recommending this just because this is a book that a lot of people are scared to read. A lot of people do not want to read this book because of the subject matter. But I want to go ahead and give it some attention because this is truly a beautiful, beautiful book. And it's truly one that I feel deserves to be read despite some of the uncomfortable subject matter that happens in here. I'm talking about All the Ugly and Wonderful Things by Bryn Greenwood. Now the reason why a lot of people do not want to read this is because it deals with a sexual relationship with a minor. So this follows our main character Wavy and she is not the product of great circumstances. Her dad, if I remember correctly, is like a drug dealer. Her mom was very neglectful. She didn't really pay attention to Wavy or her younger brother. So Wavy at just like the tender age of six or seven years old became the caretaker for her baby brother. So she was very much neglected. She was not looked after. And then you meet Kellen. Now Kellen is kind of one of the henchmen for her father. So in theory, you could say that maybe he's not a good man, but he recognizes that Wavy is not being taken care of properly. So when the book starts, I want to say that Wavy is around six or seven. She meets Kellen when she's around eight. And I want to say that he's in his early twenties. So there's about a 16 year age gap between the two. And he wipes out on his motorcycle and Wavy goes and kind of takes care of him. And that's when he realizes that Wavy herself is not being taken care of. So at first he takes on the role of a father to her. He becomes her confidant, the one person that she can rely on. She trusts him. She's safe with him and he takes care of her. But as she gets older, she starts to see Kellen differently and he starts to see her differently. And when she's about 14 and he's in his late 20s, things escalate into a sexual relationship. And naturally things go off the rails from there, especially when Kellen is sent to prison and all of that stuff. But throughout the entirety of the story, you are rooting for Kellen and Wavy. I cannot explain it better than that. You want them to be together. You like Kellen. You know that he would never hurt Wavy and that his feelings towards her are pure love. You know what I mean? He is not sick. He is not a pervert or anything like that. He truly, truly loves Wavy and you are rooting for that relationship to happen. And I just thought that this was wonderful. In fact, this is a book that I would consider rereading just because I want to experience this relationship again, which is so unusual. And it's one that people are not really comfortable reading. I thought Bryn Greenwood was able to do a phenomenal job of putting that relationship on the page and making you love and root for them. So if you are scared going into the story, I promise you it is a beautiful story. It is fantastically written and it is worth your time and it is worth the read. And so I wanted to highlight it here. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are some of the underrated books that I wanted to bring to your attention in case you had never heard of them or maybe you had never thought to read them. But I hope that I might have convinced you to put them on your radar and give them a shot because I truly adored each and every one of the books that I featured in this video. And I definitely think they deserve some more time in the spotlight. As always, please comment down below and let me know some of your favorite underrated books. I would love to know that information. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and just leave me a simple thumbs up emoji to let me know that you were here. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to see you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which you can always find linked down below along with any books that I might talk about in a video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.